This is From Our Neurons to Yours, a podcast from the Wu Tsai Neurosciences Institute at Stanford University. On this show, we crisscross scientific disciplines to bring you to the frontiers of brain science. I'm your host, Nicholas Weiler. We are going to start today's episode with this thought experiment. Pretend you're the size of a molecule, and you're able to sit right on the opening of a human ear canal. You're exactly at the interface between sound in the outside world and sound entering the ear on its way to the brain. What exactly happens next? What is the process by which sound becomes information? And more specifically, what is the process by which human speech is transformed into meaning? I can explain all of the stuff that happens in order for people to understand language. Laura Williams studies this very question as a faculty scholar at the Wu Tsai Neurosciences Institute. So first of all, take the auditory signal of speech. This is is just fluctuations in air pressure that some of those fluctuations of the air particle travel down our ear canal and beat on our eardrum, then the fluctuations of the eardrum actually get amplified by these tiny little bones that are connected to the eardrum. So this takes very minute fluctuations and and amplifies them, makes them more extreme. Those vibrations then get sent to what's called the cochlea. It looks like a snail shell, but it's only about a centimeter or so tall. So it's, it's quite tiny. The cochlea receives these vibrations, but what's really amazing is that this cochlea contains tiny little hand cells. But they're basically little sound sensors. Exactly. So these little hair cells vibrate. You have some hair cells which like to vibrate when the pitch of the sound is high. These cells live at the very beginning of the cochlea. And then as you travel down this little nail shell structure, the hair cells prefer to vibrate to lower and lower frequency. So if you're hearing, let's say, a bird chirping, the hair cells at the base of the cochlea are going to vibrate versus if you hear a foghorn, that's going to be the hair cells at the what's called the apex or the the tip of of the snail shell basically splitting up the sound that's coming in into like high pitches and low pitches and everything in between so that you've now got all these different channels that you can interpret. Exactly. Then all of these hair cells connect to the cochlear nerves or the auditory nerve, sometimes called. At this point, the signals are no longer kind of analog in terms of vibrations of movement. Now we're talking about an electrical signal. So it's now been transformed into electrical impulses. These electrical impulses travel through the auditory nerves. They reach the brainstem. Some complicated things happen that I won't talk about. These go to the midbrain. And then finally, they go to the salamis, which then finally actually connects to your brain. Well, so there are a bunch of steps in this process to get from the ear all the way to the brain. It sort of has to jump several times. Right. So. The auditory signal, once it reaches your cortex, has actually gone through a lot of pre-processing and manipulation before it's even reached your brain. Once the signal reaches auditory cortex, this organization by frequency, so if you remember I said that the cochlea at the base is going to prefer high frequencies and at the tip is going to prefer low frequencies, this spatial organization is maintained in the primary auditory cortex. So if you were to look at the neuron in primary auditory cortex, you're going to see that there is a gradient of frequency. So as you're kind of hitting the notes on a C major scale, as you're going from low to high, the neurons that are fire are going to be different, but they're going to be neighboring with neighboring frequencies. So it's got this map of frequencies that's maintained in the brain. That's so cool. Yeah, it is. And up until that point, we can say that the way 
the human brain processes sound and the way that, say, monkeys or even certain types of birds uh, process sound are pretty similar. Right. This is how we hear the world around us. Exactly. But then you have speech comprehension or language abilities, which then are all built on top of these kind of basic auditory processes. So it believed that the information gets uh, rooted to primary auditory cortex and there is a higher order auditory region which lives right next door in the temporal lobe which also processes acoustic properties of the speech but it over represents or is extremely precise at processing the type of sound features that are very relevant for speech. Neurons in this brain area will code the difference between, let's say, a P sound and a B sound, and will code that difference in a more precise way than you would get from just looking at the auditory signal alone. And are these hardwired in the human brain? Like, are we born with the ability to hear these different sounds? Yeah, I love that question. So I actually, I was listening to some previous episodes of this podcast and I know you had some guests that were talking about how babies are citizens of the world, that they are able to acquire speech distinctions across any language. That was our conversation with Carla Schatz, I think. Right. I really enjoyed listening to that one. But if you're not exposed to a language, let's say the first time you are exposed, you are 32 years old, you will not have acquired the ability to essentially perceive the difference between these subtle distinctions in the same way you can distinguish them in your native language. And this is not something that you can acquire. And maybe you can kind of appreciate either if you've tried to learn a language yourself later on in life or if you have spoken to others, it's possible to acquire the syntactic structure, the meanings of words, but it's very hard to produce speech with a perfect accent. And it's also very difficult to perceive these differences in speech as well. In the perception side, there is a saving grace. Context helps to disambiguate some of these uncertainties that you might have if you were just presented with a syllable pa, ba. But these abilities are something that you need to acquire early on. And the interesting thing about language is that we have these individual speech sounds which get combined to form syllables, which you can combine to form words and then whole phrases and whole sentences. It seems that not just different parts of the brain, but also different sizes of ensembles of neurons are recruited when you're processing different properties of language at these different levels of abstraction and complexity. In general, we understand much more at the lower level of this hierarchy, so how the individual speech sounds are processed. And as you climb up the hierarchy to be much more symbolic and hardcore language and less sensory and auditory, it becomes much more challenging to study than the, the lower level. And this is one of the things I really wanted to delve in with you in this conversation, which is I was just thinking about what we do when we're listening to speech or what listeners are doing right now as they're listening to us have this conversation. We're not speaking in complete sentences all the time. There are interruptions, there are non sequiturs. It's amazing that we can keep track of conversations at all, but you don't have to think about that. Our brains are so wired to, to do that. We just hear meaning in each other's words. So I'd love to hear sort of based on your research and the research that you and colleagues are starting to do, it, it, looking at these higher level representations of meaning and sentence structure and these bigger picture things. Does that perception map on to how the brain produces and represents speech? I mean, is, are we doing it at the level of meaning? Yeah, so the short answer is that we're doing it at all levels at the same time. Just to kind of even more emphasize your point, speech comprehension is not just easy and automatic, it's almost inevitable. Like, it is very difficult for me to have this conversation with you right now and not understand what it is that you're saying. Even if I wanted to 
not understand you, I would have to actively distract myself with something else. And probably at the same time, it, it would be very distracting if you were trying to keep track of which words I'm using, because mostly we're just talking ideas. Right, exactly. Like if I decided, okay, instead of listening to the message you were trying to give to me, I'm instead going to try to notice every time you make a P sound, then, okay, I'm going to be distracted of focusing in on your sensory output and not understanding the overall message. Our experience of language is this automatic understanding or derivation of meaning from the noises that that person is making. But most of the time, you're not actually paying attention to the noise per se. You're just paying attention to the concepts and ideas that person is trying to convey to you. I could say, oh, this morning I decided to ride a cactus to work over the cloud and I did all of this while I enjoyed a nice piña colada made with puppy ears. I've got that image in my head now. Thank you. <laughs> so I managed to right, send this image to you through this noise that I just made. And that is an image that you have never conjured for yourself before. I can confirm that. Yeah. <laughs> we have this amazing ability to be creative and convey new ideas and know that the person we're conveying them to will understand. That is no small feat. And yet the kind of speed and automaticity with which it is achieved is really remarkable. Now, one thing you said was that the brain has to do processing at all of these levels at the same time. I'd love to hear more about that and, and any of the other sort of specific problems that our brains are solving without us even noticing. Right. So this is an extremely complicated problem. And the way that this is solvable is the brain has access to many different types of information about the speech at the same time and uses all information together to disambiguate what it is that's going on. So let me be a little bit more concrete. So you can make, let's say, a broad stroke distinction between the acoustic signal that's coming in and all of the stuff that you've learned about your language and about how interactions usually go with other individuals, which set up pretty strong expectations about what it is that person is about to say to you. And so you have bi-directional flow of information. The actual speech sounds that that person is making, coupled with my very strong expectations of what speech sounds that person will make and what types of concepts and ideas they are going to convey to me. If I'm talking to you and let's say we're on the street and a, a very loud truck goes by, which completely distorts four seconds of your speech. I could probably figure out that four seconds based on the context of the conversation and all the sentences that have come before that. And vice versa, let's say it is the first time that I'm talking to you and you introduced a, a completely new topic to me. Well, I don't have any expectation about what it is that you're about to say but I can use the acoustic input that you're producing in order to understand the speech sounds to form the words, which then create context, which then feeds into this subsequent bi-direction between my expectation and the sensory signal. Wow. So we've got these two streams coming together, what we're hearing and what we're expecting. And we're sort of at the interface there, figuring out what it is that's actually being said. That's so interesting. One of the other things that I wanted to ask about is there's also this component of time. At the same time as we are trying to get our brains aligned on the specific words or the specific ideas that we're saying, we also have to keep track of what you said before, sometimes within a word and sometimes within a whole sentence. As I think I've mentioned on the podcast before, I'm working on learning German and, you know, in German famously sometimes has a tendency, the verb to the end of the sentence to put. 
which, you know, for my brain is challenging because I didn't grow up with that. But it's something that we have to do in all languages, right? You have to be able to hold on to one idea while you figure out what it's referring to later on in a sentence. How does the brain even begin to do that? I love that question, Nick. Uh, you actually tap into one of the things about speech processing that get me the most excited, which is how the dynamics of speech are processed because the neurons are firing over time while the input is being received over time. And so these two dynamic signals need to be reconciled in our science. So you could imagine one scenario where you're hearing someone talk and with every speech sound they say, you say, okay, the brain processes this sound and then discards it and processes this sound and then discards it. But instead, what seems to happen is that the, the brain processes, let's say, that this was a P, like Peter, and not a, a B, like baboon. <laughs> and it actually holds on to that information for hundreds and hundreds of milliseconds, up to about a second after that speech sound has disappeared from your cochlea. In brain terms, that is a really long period of time to keep information around. Why does the brain do this? Well, it does it to solve exactly these types of conundrums that, that you're raising, which is that language, especially when received in the auditory modality of speech, you need to be able to combine and make link between things that are not next to each other. So if I say, I like Melinda yesterday, she told me that she bought a donut, whatever. When I say she, you need to link that to knowing that that was Melinda, who is she. And it seems that one way that the brain solves this is by essentially keeping a, a buffer of the information around, waiting until it receives the corresponding, say, object. Let's say that it needs to link that to. And this speaks, I think, again, to the brain is processing multiple properties of language at the same time. Let's say with the bottom-up sensory information, also the, the top-down, more semantic conceptual information. But it's not only processing multiple properties of speech at the same time, it's doing so over multiple time periods at the same time as well. The brain is extremely greedy in terms of the information that it keeps around in order to do everything that it can to disambiguate and figure out what message this person is trying to convey. Hmm, that's so funny. And that reminds me, you know, I've been thinking as we're talking of what we're now experiencing with speech to text or speech recognition technology, right? You can speak to Siri or Alexa or Google Assistant and get a response, which means that the system is able to process what you're doing. Is that in, inspired by how the human brain works or is it, does it work completely differently? These systems work very differently. The difference between the human brain and these automatic speech recognition systems are probably most prevalent when you look at, one, how much information they need to consume to be able to get something like human level performance. Like They need to have been trained on multiple lifetimes worth of data, where do you compare that to the comprehension abilities of, say, a five-year-old who have received much less data? It's just a, a credible differential of how much information these systems need in order to achieve. Right. So somehow we do this as humans so much more efficiently. You know, kids start talking at a year and they can understand some language before that. So they don't have that much data and somehow our brains are able to just lock on. We've got these systems built in to how our brains function that are really tuned to pick up and understand language. Yeah, it was a, a big discussion for a long time. And I, I guess this, the discussion is still ongoing as to how much of this kind of processing architecture and say in kind of data science terms, how many of the parameters have already been trained <laughs> before we're even born. Maybe that is part of how we're able to acquire language so quickly and so easily. We essentially have some pre-training through our evolution 
that gets us ready to process the information to use that in order to obtain comprehension abilities. Interesting. Well, it seems like studying speech gets at one of the core questions of neuroscience. How do we represent meaning in our brains? What do you think we can learn about our minds studying how we understand speech? Yeah, thank you. I think that in studying speech comprehension, you're also studying the broader question of how concepts are stored and accessed and manipulated. And in some senses, I see speech and language processing as our gateway into the mind more generally. This is the way that we kind of express what's going on inside our heads. And by understanding how language is actually organized and accessing these different thoughts and ideas and emotions, it leads you to better understand those thoughts, memories, and emotions that are actually encoded in neural activity. And so in many ways, it's the road to understanding the human condition more generally. Absolutely. Yeah, it is a really exciting area of research. And I have so many more questions I'd love to ask you, but unfortunately, we're out of time. But thank you, Laura, so much for for joining us on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thanks again to our guest, Laura Williams. For more on Dr. Williams' work, check out the links in the show notes. We are very excited for season two of From Our Neurons to Yours. If you are too, please take a moment to give us a review on your podcast app of choice and share this episode with your friends. We'll link to Apple Podcast Reviews in the show notes. This episode was produced by Michael Osborne with assistance from Morgan Honecker. I'm your host, Nicholas Weiler. <laughs>